Good morning and a warm welcome to the 31st and final meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2023. Apologies for starting slightly late this morning. We have apologies from my colleague Neil Bibby, who is substituted by Foisal Trousery, MSP, and um, not for the first time, so we welcome Foisal and there's no need to do a declaration of interests. Uh, our second agenda item is to take evidence in support of the displaced people from Ukraine and Scotland. And we are joined this morning by Emma Roddick, MSP, Minister for Equalities, Migration and Refugees. And uh, Emma is supported by Kirsten McPhee, Head of Ministerial Support, and Fraser Dick, Head of Ukraine Resettlement Finance and Finance at the Scottish Government. And uh, could I invite the Minister to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, convener. I'm glad to attend the committee for the first time in my role as Minister for Equalities, Migration and Refugees. I am aware that the committee has taken a key interest in uh, the Scottish Government's response to the war in Ukraine and undertook several evidence sessions in the spring of this year. And there has been much progress since then, so I'm glad of the opportunity to, to come along and update you on the key developments since you last considered this work. Scotland stands for democracy, human rights and the rule of law at home and abroad. Scotland offers its unqualified support for Ukrainian sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity. I'm proud of how Scotland has responded to this humanitarian crisis and I'm grateful to all of those who've opened up their homes to displaced Ukrainians fleeing the war, providing sanctuary to more displaced Ukrainians per head of population than any other UK nation. We are glad to have been able to support so many people fleeing war by working with local government, third sector and local volunteer communities. We have been clear from the outset that Scotland is your home as long as you need it. We are aware that many Ukrainians are already in the second year of their three year visa period and they are anxious about the future. I am engaging with my Home Office counterpart to seek clarity on the position and I will work with them to ensure that we communicate that uh, as early as possible to Ukrainians living in Scotland. We published the A Warm Scots Future policy position paper on the 27th of September. This outlines our new strategic priorities for support in the longer term integration of displaced people from Ukraine living in Scotland moving forward. Scotland of course has the strongest rights in the UK for people experiencing homelessness but we are committed to ensuring that no one needs to become homeless in the first place including displaced people from Ukraine. Over 26,000 people from Ukraine have now arrived in the UK with a Scottish sponsor, more than 20,500 of them through our super sponsor scheme. And as part of that Warm Scots welcome, safe and suitable welcome accommodation is provided to those arrivals who need it. Our super sponsor scheme has ensured that all arrivals in Scotland have had access to su suitable welcome accommodation and are now being supported into longer term accommodation. We are investing over £100 million in 23-24 in the Ukrainian resettlement programme to ensure that people continue to receive a warm Scots welcome and are supported to rebuild their lives in our communities for as long as they need to call Scotland their home. This builds on the significant funding of around £200 million that we provided to support resettlement in 22-23. The Warm Scots Future paper was, of course, developed in partnership by the Scottish Government, Scottish Refugee Council and COSLA and recommits partners to working to reduce numbers in welcome accommodation and provides that framework for integration within communities. We've also set out our plan to reduce the numbers of people in welcome accommodation and the length of time people are spending there. We published our response detailing the actions we're taking to reduce the use of temporary accommodation on the 19th of July. We will invest at least £60 million this year through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme to support a national acquisition plan. We will maintain momentum in delivering our Affordable Housing Supply Programme. We will work with social landlords to deliver a new programme of stock management and we will implement targeted partnership plans with local authorities facing the greatest pressure, backed by an additional £2 million. So work to set the conditions for effective delivery has been progressing in parallel to preparing our response and we're ready to hit the ground running in implementing these actions. To help continue to drive down numbers in welcome accommodation and encourage guests to move on from welcome accommodation, we are introducing a new national moving on policy requiring guests to accept reasonable offers of accommodation with a re-entry policy to prevent future uh, presentations. 
We have introduced two new policies to tackle our reliance on welcome accommodation um, and local authorities will seek to make two reasonable offers of accommodation to all displaced people. Where possible, these will be within the original local authority or a neighbouring local authority and where necessary offers can be anywhere in Scotland. I hope that's given a helpful overview of the work that's going on and willing to take questions from members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, as um, um, Mother will wish her constituency MSP, um, we're lucky to have had uh, North Lancashire Council engage in the, social, the Fund for the Social Landlords, um, and I have a tower in my own area that is, um, was dedicated for use. Uh, it's worked out extremely well with support services being on hand, and you know their families are very well integrated into local schools and organisations. But, so th that was for a £50 million fund, and my understanding is £23 million of that has been used to date. So can the Cabinet Secretary um, explain how the, the rest of that fund will, will be used and what barriers there maybe are getting that fund to get social landlords to take up that opportunity for Ukrainians? We have certainly been engaging with uh, local authorities and, and social landlords to encourage the use of uh, the fund, to, to encourage them to look at where stock might be suitable for, for coming forward. And there is a pipeline of around 100 homes for, for future development already. Um, I think as more and more of these developments open up and we see the, the success and what that's actually meant on the ground, um, more might look at it and, and see it as a, a very positive way, not just to support Ukrainians in the community, but to have that lasting legacy of, of social housing that can then be used going forward. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm going to move to questions from the committee, and I could invite first Mr Brown. Minister, um, first a quick question. We've been given a really good briefing from SPICE, which includes details on the number of people that left the two ships, Ambition and the other one. Um, and in each case, it was quite a small number of people that left to go to hosted accommodation. I think one was 1% and the other 7%. Do you have a figure for generally how many people that came went to hosted accommodation, by which I mean not those on the ships alone? Um, the other one being Victoria, and I think that, that kind of um, shows the, the success of having that support service on board because uh, residents had that space and that time while in supported accommodation to explore all of their options. And I know that many of them were keen to take up offers which allowed a, a group to, to be able to, to travel together and then continue to support each other after building up that, that kind of support network. As for figures in hosted accommodation, I don't know if we have... We can certainly look into it. The issue there is Homes for Ukraine, if they don't come on a super sponsor visa, they may go straight to hosted accommodation, so we wouldn't have access necessarily to those figures, but we can do a bit of digging and write to the committee with an update on that. OK, thanks. Um, the other issue was, I suppose, to personalise it, I, I hosted a Ukrainian family for six months and we were able to get them both permanent accommodation and a job, um, in fact two jobs. Uh, however, having stayed in contact, they're actually in your region now, Minister, stayed in contact, their real worry is what happens. They see the 18-month uh, deadline looming. Their home in Nikolaev was destroyed. They have no idea what they really would go back to. So taking all that opportunity to get a job, quite a specialist job, and having settled after I moved from Killin to me to where they are now, they're really worried. Um, is there any reason being given by the UK government as to why they won't confirm what their intentions are? And secondly, given the possibility, I'll put it no higher than that, that there could be a change in government next year, and I know you, you'll have government-to-government -government relations, is there any indication of where the Labour Party stand in relation to the future in, in terms of the three-year visa? Um, for, for Labour's position, it's not something I can speak to. Um, it's certainly the, the um, possibility of, of government changes is something we're keeping an eye on. And for my part, I'm willing to work with anyone um, who, who might be in a position to give Ukrainians in Scotland that certainty, because it is by far the issue that is raised most often with myself, with officials, when we are out speaking to the Ukrainian community in Scotland. Um, Members may be aware that I wrote to um, my Home Office counterpart yesterday, along with COSLA and the Scottish Refugee Council, pressing for this clarity to be provided. 
um, for reasons that it's not been. I think at the moment the, the Home Office position is that they've not decided what their preferred option is yet, so they're not able to, to yet communicate it to uh, ourselves or to Ukrainians living in the UK. Um, but it is something that we are in regular communication over, um, both myself and colleagues in the um, refugee space in Scotland have been pressing very regularly for any kind of timescale, any kind of update that we can provide. I, I know that this is something that impacts not just kind of family planning and travel plans, but is causing people to be hesitant about committing to long-term employment, to housing, um, everything within their lives is, is up in the air. So it's, it's something that we're very much alive to. I know officials have been working with UK officials to try and move things along as well. Um, but you know, in, in partnership with the Ukrainian government, of course, we want to make sure that that clarity is provided. Yeah, and last uh, point is, just given the work that was done to get host families, which wasn't the ideal way for people to come, but it was necessary at the time. But given the work that was done, and I have to say, like the convener, the local council, Club Manager Council, did a superb job, as did Stirling and, and Killin. Given that's been established, is there any work going on to see how uh, that may be kept as an infrastructure, almost like a resilience kind of facility? Because this committee has talked about whether um, people coming from Gaza could be accommodated in a similar way. Are, are, we, are we keeping that infrastructure? I have not heard a word since the, the family left, for example. I just wonder if it's being thought about now as to how we might use it for the future. I'll bring Kirsten in a moment on kind of planning for, for Gaza because I know that, that things are moving very quickly there. And although we're, we're focused very much on the immediate call for a ceasefire, which is absolutely the, the correct focus, we have obviously also asked the UK government to allow us to be part of a, a humanitarian response for those who do want to leave and, and need to seek a place of safety. Um, the hosted accommodation is not the, the most um, appropriate of, of infrastructure and it's not probably the, the first option that we would want to go for, but certainly I think the Homes for Ukraine policy has allowed us to prove that it can work if it's managed correctly. And um, so I think, you know, members will also be getting the same correspondence that I get from constituents who want to do their bit, want to help. And I think this could be a, a really helpful piece of the puzzle when we're dealing with humanitarian crises, but certainly not the immediate fallback. Yeah, I can just add to that. Um, so you'll be aware that the Homes for Ukraine in the UK hosting is the sort of bedrock of their approach. We've obviously taken a different approach where we have the super sponsor scheme so that people can come to Scotland safely without the need to secure a host. But hosting is still a really important part of the infrastructure and us building resilience in Scotland, particularly when we're responding to things like Gaza. So we have undertaken a review of our approach to hosting. There's a, a strategic policy focus on our hosting um, that will look at current guidance, that will look at improvements that can be made, that will engage with hosts' families and people who've stayed in hosted accommodation so we can learn those lessons and apply them to future schemes if, for example, we had to stand up a response to Gaza. OK, thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Cameron. Good morning, Minister. Um, I was going to ask about the a super sponsor scheme which has been paused uh, since uh, July 2022, um, so almost a year and a half ago. Uh, plainly, visas issued under that scheme are still um, uh, valid, but I just wondered, is there any um, intention to restart it? Is, has it now sort of served its purpose? Um, where does it stand? So, we're very alive to, to the fact that you know, that, that things can change. So with the super sponsor scheme pause, it is something that we've been reviewing regularly, previously at three months intervals, and now it's six months with the, the next review being this month. So uh, within that, there are a number of tests that if met, we would then consider reopening the scheme, including escalation in the war, meaning more people are at immediate need of, of support. But, you know, as, as the member noted, it is difficult given the number of visas that the Scottish Government has sponsored where that has not resulted in Ukrainian arrivals to, to balance and be certain that the numbers that we could then be in the position of, of needing to provide immediate support to, not knowing the scale of that and 
knowing that we have a responsibility to everyone who does come along for support to provide the best that we can and suitable accommodation and not you know end up with people having to stay in, in temporary accommodation for too long that's that's quite a difficult um, situation to manage so that's that's why we need to keep reviewing it and, and make sure that these tests are met before reopening okay, so it's still live as it, it's still live as it were yeah. and it w was there any evidence that the pause in some way disincentivized people coming or w were you are you content to say that actually it made no difference it's not something I'm aware of, um, and certainly in terms of those who were issued visas and, and didn't then come to Scotland, um, getting that information about reasons why is, is near impossible. Um, but anecdotally, it's not something that I've picked up on. No, no. We could say that the number of arrivals has steadily slowed. Mm -hmm. um, so again, as the Minister says, we, we can't account for why that might be the case but it has meant that we've had less people in welcome accommodation and we've begun to be able to move towards this focus on integration rather than this um, crisis response. I was just going to come in um, just to give some context to that fact, just to note that of visas issued who have not yet travelled to the UK, there's approximately 13,000 of those. And as you mentioned, the pause came into effect over a year ago now. So you might say it's likely that if you've had your visa for over a year at this point and have not yet travelled, you might say that it's likely, it's fairly unlikely that you that you will. You've probably made, possibly made other plans or resolved to remain in Ukraine or a myriad of other things. Um, but hopefully that, but as we say, that still is live. As you say, those people could arrive, but it is, it, it is slowing to quite a low level, as Kirsten said. Okay. It's really helpful. Can I turn to a different issue, which is about um, accommodation and uh, rent guarantees? Um, we have had evidence from the Ukrainian consul uh, a while ago now that um, he was very in favour of local authorities acting as rent guarantors to enable people uh, from Ukraine to access private rented accommodation. And Highland Council, the area that the uh, Minister and I both represent, um, already operates such a scheme. I think Edinburgh and Glasgow were also part of a national working group looking into that. I just wondered, has that group uh, reported and is there any action the Scottish Government can take to help local authorities introduce rental guarantee schemes? I'm aware at this point over half of, of local authorities do operate some form of scheme and we did look into the, the feasibility of, of something wider. Um, I don't have the report from the work so this, the, the difficulty accessing the PRS is, is not something that's unfortunately unique to Scotland and we do have ongoing conversations again with the other nations about how better we can facilitate access to the private rented sector. It's a really difficult question and obviously different areas do things a bit differently. Um, in terms of a national approach, we have paused that in terms of pursuing other um, measures to support Ukrainians into longer term accommodation. But as the Minister says, there are a number of local authorities that already have their own guarantor schemes and we continue to keep in contact with them to learn lessons and, and to support them to help uh, displaced people access the private rented sector. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. Um, Mr Ruskell? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm aware that I think there's still about 3,000 people that are still in the, the welcome accommodation and the councils are working very hard to offer people, I guess, two options really, you know, moving into a tenancy or moving into hosted accommodation. Uh, there's still though, a group of people who would prefer to stay in that welcome accommodation. Um, I'm thinking in particular about rural situations where maybe somebody's moved into a hotel like the Killin Hotel, uh, Mr. Brown's already mentioned. Um, they've maybe got a job in the local area. They're quite settled, really. But the accommodation options within that community are pretty limited. So I'm just, I'm just wondering if that is still an issue, because it was an issue previously. And in that particular incidence, you know, a number of people moved out. Indeed, family obviously come to stay with Mr. Brown, which is great. Um, but I'm just wondering to what extent those people who've become quite settled in those areas um, and quite, quite satisfied with the situation that they're in whether there's still a bit of a residual issue there to support those people with what's yeah. appropriate that they want. Yeah, I think it's a, a really good question which helpfully recognises the, the nuance here because there is kind of a, a tendency of, of some to view Ukrainians as a, a homogenous group and they're absolutely not and there are people who um, you know, may, may be seeking safety here but view their 
uh, residency in Scotland is extremely temporary, don't want to be here uh, any longer than necessary and you know, are kind of ready to, to move back to Ukraine any day. Um, and it is tough for many people to then think about kind of long-term housing options in Scotland when that's not where their heads are at. Um, and it's, it's not solely an issue for, for kind of more rural areas. Um, members will be aware of the, the housing situation in Edinburgh. It's very difficult to, to find uh, private rents here as well. Um, and there were many Ukrainians that I spoke to on the MS Victoria who would have loved to, to just stay on the boat um, for a good few years. Um, but obviously our focus is to get people into longer term suitable accommodation as, as soon as possible. So that is very sensitive um, when we're, we're trying to maybe have policies that are at odds with the, the feelings of, of people who are not ready to, to think about long term in Scotland. But um, that's why we're, we're offering that kind of wraparound support, working with local authorities, working with the third sector to make sure people know what their options are and feel supported and welcomed for as long as they need to be here, even if that's a bit longer than, than they yeah. hoped. Yeah. Uh, and where Stirling Council, in mean, that particular incident, has done you know, great work uh, in a very complex and sensitive situation. But is your, is your impression that councils are, are able to, to support people right now? Are there, are there particular areas where there's a difficulty and councils are struggling? You mentioned Edinburgh. There may be other, work, other areas where there's housing pressures or... Yeah, there are, there are certainly difficulties, um, but I, I would point more to the, the successes in, in some councils. And Edinburgh has certainly been one where the, the wraparound support has been very good and the partnership working with, with third sector has been very visible. Um, and, and that's, you know, despite housing pressures and, and despite that. So, um, yeah, we, we do work to encourage other local authorities to kind of step up their game and, and make sure they're doing everything they can to, to support Ukrainians in, in their uh, locales or, or to uh, let Ukrainians who are currently in, in welcome accommodation know what the options are within their area if it's not one that, that's been considered yet. Um, but no, there's, there's really good uh, examples across the country and, and it's yeah, not always about the housing pressures but just thinking a bit more creatively and, and working with the third sector. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shute, did you want to? Yeah. Can I just ask, you, you, you've talked about the successes and there's no question there has been successes, Minister. Uh, but what is the working relationship between yourself as the government and the Refugee Council and COSLA? Uh, you've talked about you, you want a targeted approach when, when you're dealing with local authorities and, and that structure. So how successful has that been? Because I think that was very good in the, in the initial, uh, when, when we had the, the large numbers of people who required and support was given. Uh, how has that now progressed uh, during the, the, the timescale and, and are there any barriers that you're, you're now finding within certain local authorities who are not able now to give as much as they did in the past? Yeah, I would, I would recognise that everyone's under, under pressure and, and there are lots of competing priorities, but you know, I'm, I'm still very proud of the work that, that we've done in partnership with, with COSLA and the Scottish Refugee Council. And as for that relationship, I would describe it as very strong. Um, I meet with the New Scots partners extremely regularly, twice this week. And um, I, I would hope that they would also describe it as a, a strong and positive relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, the letter, of course, that went yesterday to the Home Office pressing for clarity on the visa issue was joint from the three of us. So, um, yeah, I would, I would say that it's, it's very strong, consistent. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jodie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Minister, uh, I've visited MS Victoria and MS Ambitions and uh, spoken with and seen the service they've been getting. Uh, obviously, they are uh, in a temporary accommodation just now, and I'm not sure if they're getting the same sort of service at the, what they were getting. Uh, Given the, I mean, you, you, you've mentioned that Edinburgh, but I think every council in Scotland are struggling with a uh, housing crisis. So uh, what discussions are you guys having with uh, the councils to see, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't look like that conflict is going to end very soon. Uh, uh, so uh, for long-term uh, housing, what discussions are you having with the councils? 
So the progress on uh, moving displaced Ukrainians into longer term accommodation has been really positive and as, as we move along the, the numbers of people in temporary welcome accommodation is, is dropping at a, a steady rate. Um, and I think we've we've seen that since the disembarkation of, of the two ships is, you know, whereas previously we had to keep quite a lot of welcome accommodation available in, in case the disembarkation needed, you know, a, a bit of support. Um, we, we've now been able to, to consistently move away from those numbers of rooms and, and bring down the, the monthly costs of the, the Ukrainian scheme. Um, and that has been possible because Ukrainians are, are more and more finding uh, longer term accommodation that, that's suitable for them. Uh, the, I think uh, Kristen mentioned that, that, that super sponsor scheme. Is that still open? It's paused. All right, okay. And so the last question the, the current immigration uh, measures in, uh, taken by the Westminster, do you think that will affect the? negotiations or um, with Ukrainians or any other refugees wanting to come into Scotland? I hope that it won't have a, a direct impact on, on Ukrainians living in Scotland and there's certainly no kind of um, procedural reason that it should given the, the way that their visas have been issued. Um, my main worry in, in terms of Ukrainians would be uh, the longer term position on visas and, and getting them that clarity as, as soon as possible so that they can start to plan and so that we and their employers and councils can, can start to plan as well. Um, more generally, I am worried about the impact of the uh, new immigration proposals, the Rwanda Bill, the Illegal Migration Act, the National Alien Borders Act on the impression of the UK internationally. And I think that, you know, most, most Ukrainians I've spoken to have been very positive about their experience of being supported and welcomed by Scotland. Um, but I worry about how well we're able to get that message across about the support that's available here. Um, if the first impression that Ukrainians and, and anyone else seeking safety have of Scotland as part of the UK is that they're not welcome here. 38,000 salary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms Forbes. Thank you very much. Um, and unfortunately, I fear that uh, Ukraine and now the situation in the Middle East are not going to be the last conflicts in the world, maybe stating the obvious. And uh, Scotland has always led the way in terms of uh, trying to offer support and asylum where we can. I wondered, first question is, what do you think we have learned from the response to help house Ukrainians that would inform our response to refugees uh, from Gaza if we are able to facilitate um, asylum for them? Gosh, uh, so many things. <laughs> I think um, the, the positive response and the way that people um, and I don't just mean our, our partnerships with local councils and third sector community groups, um, but the way that people came forward to support Ukrainians, whether it was you know, organising collections of aid or money or you know, helping those whenever people heard that oh, there's a, a Ukrainian family moving into to our island community, they, they all surrounded and, and came together to make sure that those, those people were felt safe and felt a part of the community. Um, and I think that showed, um, particularly given the, the difference between you know, Scotland, we said we would take in 3,000. We've ended up almost 25,000. Mm. Um, that's, that's quite an incredible number and it shows that we can support people when we want to. Yeah. And in terms of um, the provision of accommodation, obviously, that had to be done at record speeds in terms of identifying accommodation. Um, some of that was very much temporary. Do you think that we might in future be able to arrange for the rapid provision of temporary accommodation um, that's a bit more permanent from the very beginning rather than having to draft in boats or whatever? I think from, from the beginning, we've, we've been willing to be really creative about um, finding accommodation, suitable accommodation uh, with wraparound support. 
Um, so, yes, we'd be willing to, to explore, as we have in this, any, any ideas and any availability of, of uh, suitable buildings or space that can be, can be used effectively. Um, but, you know, in terms of the MS ambition, the MS Victoria, uh, like Faisal Shaudri, I, I did <coughs> go on board the boat and was incredibly impressed with the, the services that were available. And I think it's an example of, of temporary accommodation done well, uh, where people were welcomed and, and given all the support that they required to then find longer term accommodation. If I could ask one last one, if that's okay. Just around Obviously, we, we, we can do all that we can in terms of accommodation and services, but ultimately, we still don't have power to actually grant um, visa or access to the UK. And I know that there's an, a lot of organisations and charities, particularly Sanctuary Foundation, who worked very closely with us when it came to Ukraine that really want to work closely with us when it comes to the Middle East. Mm. Um, and I wonder, this may not be a question that you can answer, but whether having worked quite collaboratively with the UK government on the Ukraine situation, whether we have sort of tried and tested ways now of saying, look, we've got X number of homes available for refugees and um, we can look after them. Can you please just uh, enable? And that's not unique to the Middle East uh, anywhere. No. Um Absolutely, and, and that's, that's something that we've been doing for the last few months is I've been very clear, the First Minister has been very clear with the UK government that, that Scotland stands ready now. If the UK government made moves to open up a resettlement scheme for people who need to leave Gaza and need to seek safety, we've been very clear that Scotland will do its part and, and take in refugees and, and support them in the same way that we did with Ukrainians and, and likewise for uh, other situations, we've also been clear that we would uh, use the Scottish NHS to support uh, injured and sick children in Gaza. Um, so it is very frustrating that those aren't powers that, that lie with us. And I think um, over the, the last few weeks, we've been very clear about what an independent <coughs> Scotland would do differently, setting out what our immigration system would look like and, and being clear that that would be based on treating other humans with dignity, fairness and respect. Um, but in the meantime, this is the, the system that we operate within and we've been very clear to the UK government that if, if those routes were opened up, we're ready. Thank you. Yeah. One uh, small point, we, we should always take, I would hope, refugees because of refugees and for no other reason. But I wondered, maybe it sounds a little bit cynical, if any part of the um, argument you're making to the UK government to move on with the uh, visa um, extension, if that's what happens, is informed by the skills needs that we have in Scotland or the skills that the, uh, the refugees which have come here have and making the case that these are very important to Scotland as well? Yes, um, that's, that's an argument that we make uh, for migration overall, but certainly in, in the, the context of individual schemes uh, as well. I'm aware that there are Ukrainians who are contributing massively uh, to, to different sectors that were previously really struggling to recruit. And, and when I was on the MS Victoria at that time, 85% were, were in employment of, of some kind. So I think that shows we've got a cohort here who not only need our support, but are, are so very willing and, and able to work and, and very often in sectors that, that are struggling at the moment to, to recruit domestically. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a point that's been made to the UK government, um, both in terms of Ukraine and, and for wider migration needs. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone else want to come in? I think we've exhausted questions from the committee. Um, ju just on that note, you used the phrase earlier on, Minister, um, that we can welcome people when we want to. And I'm going to mention my constituency again, because in my lifetime we've had Vietnamese boat people, Chilean refugees, Nigerian, Congolese, Syrian, uh, and now U the UK settlement. So we are well used to doing this. Um, but I am struck that the committee took evidence from the Cabinet Secretary um, in this, roughly the same time scale on Ukraine, and we had him in on Gaza as well. But in the Ukrainian session, we were already talking about 
how to bring people in the visa, you know, everything was in motion. Um, is, it, is there any indication, do you have any explanation as to why the process for Gaza is, is so much slower than the immediate response to the, the situation in Ukraine? I couldn't, I would, I would be guessing at, at the details of, of what the UK government's position is, but I think, you know, from our perspective, one of the difficulties is that while there are people displaced internally within Gaza, they're not classed as refugees while they are still in that place. So that's perhaps a difficulty um, and the, the, the struggle that many have had to um, kind of cross any border at this point has, has made it a lot harder for, for neighbouring countries to provide the, the kind of support that, that Poland was able to uh, to Ukraine. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I think that is exhausted our session with you this morning and um, thank you for your first attendance. I'm sure it thank won't you. be the last, but we're uh, very glad to see you this morning uh, and thank you. We're going to suspend now.
Um, thank you and a warm welcome back to the 35th meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2023. Um, I have a question to put to the committee first of all and that is a decision to take business in private. Are members content to take item four in private? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, we now move to our um, next agenda item, which is uh, on to take evidence in the committee's inquiry into the Scottish Government's national outcomes and indicators relating to international policy. And we're joined remotely this morning by Catriona, or is it Katrina or Catriona? You can maybe confirm that. Uh, head of Beijing office, Katrine. Feldinger, Head of the Copenhagen Office, and Christopher Thompson, Head of Washington DC Office, Scottish Government. And thank you all for taking the time to, to join us this, this morning. Uh, hopefully all the technology will work for us. Um, I wonder if I could open with a question about the annual report, which was published on Monday. It outlines three main pillars of work and seeks to connect these with national outcomes uh, and the network outcomes. But in terms of the national indicators, the, le the level below the outcomes in the national performance framework, no indicator has been developed specifically for international network. Um, and, and just do you think this is something that needs to be worked on? And if so, how would it be measured? And if I could maybe go to Ms Radcliffe first. Um, uh, Claire. Yeah, we're just hearing you now. So, thanks. Ah, great. Hello. Um, uh, just to confirm, it's Katrina, um, not Katriona, um, uh, for, for the rest of the morning. Um, thank you, and thank you uh, for inviting uh, me and my, my colleagues in Washington and Copenhagen to the, to the session this morning. Uh, we all look forward to, to speaking to you um, about the work that we do uh, overseas. Um, in answer to the question, um, in terms of us uh, overseas in the Scottish Government uh, offices, um, we submit annually uh, monitoring and evaluation returns. Um, so through those returns, we try and provide as much quantitative and qualitative evidence um, across all areas of work that we cover um, as possible. Um, although uh, I would uh, be honest and say in terms of, um, you know, diplomatic work and international work is not always easy um, to find the, the quantitative uh, evidence uh, uh, to back up the, the work that we do and we deliver uh, overseas. Um, I also uh, I know that, yeah, there, there isn't, as you say, a, a specific indicator um, uh, for um, uh, international work at the moment. Um, I believe that is being uh, developed and reviewed by uh, colleagues uh, back uh, in headquarters. Um, they want to, to better align uh, the data that we capture through the annual reporting, um, you know, as, as the com committee requested. Um, and just finally to note that the, the annual report that was published um, on Monday, I believe, is the first uh, time that uh, we've published the report and also the first time that we've published the monitoring and evaluation um, information uh, publicly. Um, so I hope that's a, a step in, in the right direction. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Katrine, please. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, and good to see the technology is working. So happy days. Uh, so, so I will add to what uh, what Katrina is has said. I think one of the, I mean, the main purpose of of essentially all diplomatic and intel work overseas is to make sure that your home government has the best information possible on which to take decisions. And I think if you were to look at what indicators it would be possible to develop around that for for having an international network you are inevitably, as Katrina says, in, into the sort of the qualitative territory because we could count the number of people that we're meeting and that would tell us nothing about the, the quality of it or whether it's actually furthering the aims that the government has. 
I think uh, where we where we can and where we do hold ourselves to account internally is around the quality of the conversations we're having, the seniority of the interlocutors that we are that we are able to to meet, uh, and and also the the nature of the relationship between those relationships and the work that we're trying to promote overseas. Uh, we have a we have a mandate uh, each of the international offices specifically, uh, and we also have a series of missions that the Scottish government is is running at until certainly the end of this parliament as well as the national indicators. So we actually have quite a lot of guidance on what it is that we are that we're here to achieve. The next trick down is then to figure out how we turn that into what we see as the business plans where we have traction in the areas that we work in and making sure that we are targeting as many high value interlocutors and, and networks in those specific areas. And that really is the trick. How you quite develop that into a national indicator it, it is very difficult as Katrina says to do that in a, in a quantitative method but hopefully in the annual report what you're seeing is, is us beginning to really do that at a qualitative level and uh, I, I trained as a statistician so I can say this with some confidence that the, the uh, plural of anecdote is not data until you have enough of them and then it starts to help. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Christopher Thompson please. <laughs> Sorry, just making sure the technology works. Uh, good morning, convener, and, and thanks for, for having us. I would just echo what, what Kat and Kat have both said. Uh, we do a huge amount of work to make sure that we hold ourselves to account in what we do overseas, but it is very difficult to draw straight lines between diplomatic work and, and outcomes. I know that colleagues are working really hard on that, and that's common across all governments. That's not something that's peculiar to the Scottish government. It's something that we, we all wrangle with. Uh, Am I struggling for volume? Oh, I, I'm asking them to switch the sound up. We can hear you, but it's it's straining a little bit. But they've switched it up now. Thank you. I'm also trying not to speak too loudly uh, to wake my wife up because it's five thirty oh. in the morning here in DC. Uh, Our sympathy, some apologies again. <laughs> worse things have happened. Uh, so yeah, we 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 know what outcomes we're we're trying to contribute to. I mean, uh, in terms of globally competitive, entrepreneurial, and sustainable economy, we know. Uh, particularly on open, connected and positive contribution and other things as well in terms of culture, in terms of thriving and innovative businesses. We know what we're doing and what we're setting out to do, but we also know that our colleagues at home are working really hard to figure out exactly how you measure that and fit it into the national performance framework. It doesn't mean that we're not doing that work uh, just now. And I don't think I've got much to add because I think Kat and Kat uh, captured it quite succinctly. Thank you very much. If I could just ask another um question around the national indicators. Um, so there are a number that do apply to Scotland um, international policy in terms of reputation and international exporting. Um, so the committee is recently back from a visit to Belfast and Dublin uh, in an inquiry work. And um, we met with the, um, the, the in, in, in Dublin with the, the Irish officials um, working in the international office. And they, they mentioned that um, they were just about to open their 131st mission in the world. Um, so slightly different scale to what Scotland has at the moment, um, but indicated that soft power was off, often the way to open up the other issues of trade and the other conversations that are happening. So I just wondered how, how you, what was the focus of your work and how you balance those two, two areas, how you use soft power? Um, okay. Christopher, you're on screen. If you could go first again, thanks. Yeah, happy to. I mean, I couldn't agree more with with our Irish counterparts that soft power is is a big part of it. I work in collaboration with SDI, our international trade body, and we set uh, joint objectives during the year. Uh, we have a joint business plan, and I think last time I checked, we had about 130, 140 different activities during the year, and it's about using the the in that you have to then be able to talk about what Scotland does, particularly in the US when people imagine Scotland, and we use the word imagine deliberately, they think of Braveheart or uh, Outlander or these versions of Scotland that are rooted in the past and what we do. And there's a lot of love for that. There's a lot of love for you know, whiskey and tartan and traditional versions of Scotland. And what we do through soft power is bring people into conversations and then say, but did you know? You know, for example, in the US, because we've got a huge relationship with the space sector, that Scotland produces more small satellites than anywhere else outside the US. And once you start having those conversations, you start talking about what, where Scotland is now. And you start having conversations that lead us to trade, investment and modern versions of Scotland rather than just traditional versions of Scotland. And as an example of that recently, we had a reception on Capitol Hill 
for staffers and members uh, in collaboration with the Scotch Whiskey Association and the Distilled Spirits Council of the US, the, the SWA's counterpart. And they wanted to talk about tariffs on uh, whiskey, but when we were in the room, we happened to be talking to a bunch of Floridian uh, chiefs of staff from Congress and talking about space. And as an upshot of that, we have our meeting scheduled for January, where we're going to be talking to a delegation from Florida and the Science, Space and Technology Committee in the House of Representatives to talk about Scotland's space sector and what we can do to collaborate and work more closely with them. So that little bit of soft power, bringing them in with that version of Scotland that people are familiar with and comfortable with, and then beginning to talk to them about something more substantive is something that we spend our entire year doing. And we we see benefits from it and we, we're working to do more and more of that through the year. Thank you. Um, Katrine, would you like to come in on this? Yep, sure, thank you. I think in addition to uh, to Chris stating that we, we use soft power quite a lot as, as uh, conversation openers, essentially. It's uh, the, the, the kind of the, we have an incredible brand actually to work with. It's got incredibly high brand recognition and it's also really well liked. Uh, so we had a, I mean, we had a survey recently in Denmark that showed that 91% uh, of respondents had a favorable view of, of Scotland. That's, that's an incredible figure. Uh, and I would love to say that that means we're doing really well, but to be honest, we opened 18 months ago. So actually I think that's just the baseline here. Um, I think the other thing that we can, that we can do with it is, is quite often soft power is actually more than soft power. So a lot of the work that we do on uh, cultural space, for example, absolutely opens the doors to, to partnerships and to conversations, but it can also have very, very real impacts. We are doing a, a project next year uh, with the Nordic Council of Ministers and with the Nordic Council uh, of Composers, where they have a, an annual classical music festival Next year, it will be held for the first time ever as a joint production with a country, and they've picked Scotland. So it's coming to it's coming to Glasgow. Get your tickets. Uh, but also, what that allows us to do is actually to support them in doing uh, artist and composer exchanges. And at the end of all of that, you've got to remember that for the Scottish artists that take part in this, the Nordics are a market of 27 million people with a GDP the size of Russia's before the war started. So it's massive. And the ability to connect the sort of the soft power and this impression of the vibrancy, uh, in particular, on the kind of the modernity of, of Scotland, which, which connects really well with, with the Nordic countries, with actual real measurable outputs in terms of culture in to see a major event like that, or uh, Scottish artists getting booked to play across the, the Nordic countries, is really, really powerful. Thank you. And Katrina? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, soft power uh, um, plays a, a massive part in the work that we, we do here in China. Um, we focus our work across uh, three pillars um, on climate and biodiversity, on what we call our people to people link. So that covers education, culture, tourism, and social policy, and also trade and investment. And the soft power cuts across all of those three pillars. Um, I think maybe just to give you a, a, an added dimension um, to add to what um, Chris and uh, Katrine were talking about um, is the value of using uh, tools like social media uh, to reach a wider audience here. Um, so, you know, China population of 1.425 billion. How do you even begin to try um, and engage uh, and deliver on our people-to-people -people links uh, with such a vast country. Um, one of the, the best tools that we have here to do that is through um, our official social media, media channels. Um, so we have uh, uh, three channels that we use here. One is Weibo, which is like the, the Twitter equivalent uh, back home. Another is WeChat, which we use for slightly longer articles. Uh, and the third is something called Little Red Book, which is a bit like Instagram. Um, now, this is still a drop in the ocean compared to the size of the population of China. Uh, but on our official Weibo account, we have 250,000 followers. On WeChat, we have 13,000 followers. And Little, Little Red Book, we've just opened, we have 11,000 followers. So whatever we do, um, we can multiply the audience by posting uh, on those channels and sharing what we do. Um, a recent example is um, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Mr. Robertson's visit to China. Um, so he came uh, from the 23rd to the 28th of November. 
Um, it was a six day visit across three cities. Um, uh, the first ministerial visit to China from the Scottish government since 2019 and post pandemic. So it was really important for us to, to, to use that visit to maximum benefit um, uh, and to reach as many people as possible. Um, we posted on our social media channels every day at the end of the visit to update people on what he'd been doing, what he'd been saying, who he'd been meeting, um, and uh, to share, uh, you know, the Scottish government values and what we do here. Um, his roundup vlog, he did a vlog uh, to round up uh, uh, everything that he did uh, over those six days. Uh, that vlog alone um, received over 220,000 views. Um, so it's just a wee example of, of a different you know, type of soft power, but something that's really powerful uh, in terms of how we engage um, out here uh, in China. Can I just clarify, was that 220,000 views within China or globally? Sorry, within China. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to questions from the committee. I'll move first to Ms Forbes. Thanks very much and uh, delighted that you could join us, uh, particularly at that unearthly hour of 5am. Um, uh, my first question is that each of you will obviously be working towards the, the Scottish Government overall objectives uh, for Scotland, but equally I imagine you have um, short-term objectives for each of the offices. And I wondered, um, standing, starting with um, uh, Kat, in terms of your objectives for the first um, 18 months of the Copenhagen office, um, what have been your uh, immediate objectives and do you feel like you're making progress on those objectives? And I suppose to Katrina and, and Christopher, in terms of your own uh, short-term objectives for the office, uh, what will feel like an achievement and an accomplishment when it comes to um, perhaps uh, moving on or, or considering next steps? Yeah, I, does Kat want a uh, Copenhagen office? Kat from Copenhagen office. I'm getting confused with the Katrines and Katrinas. You, can, you, can, you can, if you like, stick with calling me Kat and Katrina, if you can be <laughs> Katrina for today. That's absolutely fine. Uh, Ms Forbes, nice to see you again. Uh, so... Um, so I think, I mean, the, sh the short answer is anytime you take on what is essentially a bit of a startup within government territory, the, the first set of objectives are, are about getting that right. So how do you land in market and, and make a reasonably sized impact, but one that's also kind of right sized in that if you give yourself so much follow up work to do that, you actually fail in doing that, then you're not really doing yourself any long term favours. So so we had some some short term objectives for the first year about having a couple of high profile visits that helped us generate some press and attention around the fact that we had uh, we had landed essentially in, in the Nordics. Uh, we had a couple of quite internal facing objectives actually about getting the team right for uh, the kinds of things that we thought that the Nordics might be interested in, in talk to, talking to us about and making sure that we had the right skill sets, the right policy backgrounds to, to be able to do that. Uh, and then we had a big set of, of objectives about getting the relationship with our host British embassies Right. So we have uh, uniquely, I think, in, in the network, we have the, the task of working with uh, either three, five or eight, depending on how you cut the, the Nordics and Baltics network that the, uh, the UK government runs. Uh, and so making sure that we have enough time span, essentially, to get the relationship right with each of those teams, understanding what their priorities are in, in the, the single country that they're in and, and how we can sort of work with that and, and, and augment it has been a really, really big part of the, the work for the first 18 months. I also think it's a part of the work that's paid off really, really well, because we're now at a stage where, with those embassies, we're starting to have annual organised events. So Burns St Andrews starting to roll out across different countries uh, in, in terms of kind of a nice high profile cultural event. Um, we have a really good understanding of what their priorities are. And we therefore have a really good understanding of where Scotland has something unique to offer to, for example, Sweden or Norway. And we can therefore brief the British Embassy, make sure that they are drawing us into conversations. And for only three people in, in the Nordic region, that actually gives us quite a big bang for our box. Uh, so so that's, been a, that's been a really deliberate part of the strategy. Um, I would say we've had 
a good measure of success, as I say, on that one, but also on the press. We have the press is pretty interested in the fact that we consistently look to the Nordics as a as a model for policy for Scotland, mm. uh, and uh, and that keeps us going with uh, with making sure that we are are making new friends across comms as well. We had uh, former first minister out. Of course, that's always going to be quite high profile. But we've also had uh, Patrick Harvey. We have had uh, Miss Martin, and for all of those, we've had some some really nice high profile hits, which have got us inquiries from people that we wouldn't necessarily have thought to get in touch with. Okay, um, Katrina. Hi, yes, um, thank you. Actually, it's, it's a really nice question to, to get, <laughs> to be able to answer. Um, uh, so, so thank you for, for asking it. I think, first of all, in terms of um, short-term goals, um, I started in this role um, last July in 2022, uh, when China was in the middle um, of the, the pandemic and they still had their zero dynamic COVID policy. Um, that changed in December 2022. Um, so in terms of the goals this year, um, uh, you know, I think the office, our office had a very clear purpose, um, and that was to, to re-engage and to reinvigorate the links uh, with China post-pandemic um, uh, and across the three pillars that I referred to before um, and that would bring benefits to Scotland. So nothing too complicated. That was our sort of overall purpose. Um, the first six months, um, we focused on uh, getting out and about ourselves um, around China and also engaging with local government, um, which is really important for us and to, to you know, serve the, the whole of government approach um, uh, that we have as the, the Scottish government. Um, so we travelled to uh, several places, to Shanghai, to Guangzhou, to Shenzhen, to Chengdu, to Kunming um, as an office. Um, and then the second half of the year for us was all about uh, getting external visitors uh, in engaging at that uh, senior level. Um, so we had a visit from the Director um, of External Affairs in the Scottish government um, uh, a couple of months ago, and then followed by uh, Mr. Robertson in November. Um, so really for us this year has been about re-engaging and reinvigorating the links. In terms of what would success look like uh, for me at the end of this posting, um, I'm a, a career diplomat. I've been a diplomat for over 20 years. Uh, this role with the Scottish Government has been great because it means I can join up the experience of being a diplomat with my Scottish background. Um, so success for me would be by the end of my tenure, actually having delivered something of value and benefit to Scotland. Um, that's not always easy to do. Um, if I would pick out one thing and just to give again a bit of an extra dimension, um, something we've been working on uh, this year under the social policy part of the people to people pillar uh, is sharing how the Scottish government um, approaches um, its policy on alleviating poverty um, and particular, particularly um, alleviating period poverty. Um, we shared uh, updates on our social media last year about this and it actually got really good traction in China and generated a lot of debate. Um, so we followed up on that this year um, by uh, working with uh, a local NGO to try and bring uh, more of a spotlight to the issue. Um, also, uh, when Mr Robertson was out, um, that was uh, an element of his uh, visit programme as well, uh, to talk about the issue. Um, so if I can build on that over the rest of my time here and with my team, and try and make a difference uh, in that area, then I think to me that would be um, uh, a sign of uh, success and progress. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christopher? Sorry, I had to wait to <laughs> click a button to unmute. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Thank you for the question, Ms Forbes. Uh, we have six uh, in-year objectives here in the US office. Uh, some of them, as we touched on, are not entirely measurable about uh, trying to enhance reputation, but most of them actually have measurements against them. Uh, and we have three in-year uh, sort of ongoing deliverables as well. So we have things that we measure that we want to be better at. But given the nature of the relationship between the US and Scotland, to 
paraphrase a presidential campaign, it's the economy stupid for us. There's a lot of work we do in trade and investment. I think the annual report highlights the investment that's come into Presswick through Mangata, which is a US investment that colleagues and I have been working on for a number of years. These things for me are, are hugely beneficial. Looking at what the difference that that can make to, to people's lives in Scotland, uh, seeing jobs come in. And I'm very hopeful that we're going to see a fairly chunky announcement in the new year once we've got that confirmed with another inward investor. These things for us make a, a real difference. And ministerial visits and diplomatic work really support that. I have had conversations with our SDI colleagues who have told me that some investments have only come about because doors have been opened by Scottish ministers visiting the country with us and they get access to people that they would never get before. So you begin to have conversations that you'd never have. For example, this year, uh, through the visit of Mr. Arthur, uh, talking predominantly about community wealth building, we were able to meet with the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois. And that might not sound like an incredibly exciting thing, but Illinois is the 17th biggest economy of the, in the world. And the Lieutenant Governor brought her directors for economic development uh, and investment into the the room that meant I could be in the room that meant our trade and investment specialists could be in the room and conversations have then developed from that uh, which we are hopeful will lead to Scottish companies exporting and engaging in the US and US companies investing in Scotland so these are these are big focuses for us but we also look at what we can do in terms of culture and uh, and our diaspora as well I've been engaged with uh, diaspora and cultural organizations which have received uh, huge amounts of grant funding and scholarship funding through the US and Whilst I can't always draw a straight line and say that's directly because of me, one this week I directly came because of an introduction we made in the US, putting tens of thousands of pounds into cultural organisations in Scotland. These are the things that I feel really good about. This is what success is like for us. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's lots and lots more we can do. The US is a country of 330 million people. Right now my office is three people. So there's, there's definitely more that we can do, uh, but there are brilliant wins that we've had so far. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of things that you can't measure and things that you can measure. But I think going back to what Kat said at the start, some of it's just about the stuff that you know is doing good. Uh, and that's what we spend our year doing. Thank you. Ms Forbes, are you? Thanks very much for that. I mean, I think um, it, obviously I wouldn't draw you to comment on political matters. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's really interesting how Scotland maximizes the brand that Kat talked about there because in a sense there's an advantage which you may not have for elsewhere uh, and secondly it's fascinating to see people relate to Scotland as an entity in and of itself rather than just necessarily being subsumed within the wider um, United Kingdom. Um, if there was one uh, area you would like to see the cross-party committee here really focus on in terms of an opportunity for Scotland in the coming year, uh, what would it be? I mean, Christopher has talked really about the economy and trade and investment. Um, is there anything else to add to that? It's almost one sentence, really, of where you think we should uh, lend our cross-party support to the work that you're doing. I, I would say culture and diaspora uh, okay. are hugely important for us uh, and making sure that the awareness of Scotland, uh, our brand is uh, Scotland is now uh, across the world. A lot of people in the US think Scotland is then and they think backwards and we should be thinking forwards and we should be engaging with culture and diaspora in the US to really talk about what Scotland does now. Did Katrina, Katrina want to come in on that one? Gina? That, that me, yeah. Thank you. Um, in a sentence, uh, I think uh, on higher education and supporting the links on higher education, 25% uh, of all international students at higher education institutions in Scotland are from China. That's about 20,000 uh, students per year who then travel back to China uh, and bring that positive experience of studying in Scotland uh, and then sort of become mini ambassadors. Um, so uh, cultivating those links um, with higher education, supporting higher education and uh, the students who, the international students who come, um, I think is a, a really positive step forward. Thank you. 
Yep, I, I mean, in, in a sense, you're getting sort of three of the big priorities for, for all of the offices here. So you've got diaspora, you've got higher education. I'm going to add the third one, which is around energy. The the focus we have in Scotland on delivering around Scotland, but also on hydrogen, on CCUS, on essentially what the energy networks are going to look like for the future, are so dependent on the decisions being made in the rest of Europe and around the North Sea in terms of what will the markets look like, what will offtake look like, where are the supply chains coming from? We're going to do 28 gigawatts, but the North Sea alone is going to do 300 gigawatts. The, the opportunity for Scotland to be in the middle of shaping the conditions for its own success in that space are going to be uh, absolutely enormous, but, but also something that we really, really need to seize on. And, and that would be probably where I would like to see some, some real cross-party activity. Thank you. Um, Ms Forbes, are That's you great. I'm really great. grateful for that. Thank you. Um, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning uh, to the panel. Um, thank you for being with us today. I uh, had one sort of short question uh, to Christopher on something he's just said about culture and the diaspora. Um, we've done quite a lot of work in the last few weeks and sort of more generally about um, uh, Scotland's heritage. And... Um, we, one of the items that I think came up in the last few weeks was using the diaspora or Scotland's sort of international connections, if I could put it like that, to potentially uh, help um, create funding or create opportunities for projects here in Scotland. And, you know, whether that's, you know, uh, re, you know helping uh, safeguard a ruined castle, uh, or you know, keeping a, a, a traditional music group, group going, or whatever it might be, um, I'd welcome just any further thoughts you had about how we can leverage um, international connections um, t towards that endeavour. Uh, thank you very much for, for the question, Deputy Convener. I, I think that there is a huge amount of potential there, uh, particularly in the US for Scotland, where. Uh, touching on what Katrina said, there, there's a lot of alumni of Scottish universities in the US. Uh, apart from the, the, the sort of heritage diaspora, you've got an affinity diaspora for as people who, who loved Scotland because they've spent time there. So there's, a, I think, a slightly untapped market in the US uh, for this. I think we can learn from what uh, our friends in Ireland do. They have a, a brilliant outreach to their diaspora. They have things like the Ireland Funds, where they're collecting money to, to fund on to projects in Ireland. Uh, I think there's good stuff going. If, if you look at what is, is happening with the National Trust for Scotland, they have a USA foundation, which is a registered charity in the US. They run fundraisers, they engage with people throughout the US. Their outreach is fantastic. And they pull quite a lot of money back to Scotland to help with heritage uh, projects for uh, buildings and the built environment in Scotland. So there is there are some really good examples already happening. I think we can do better. I think uh, the university and alumni connection is something that we can work on. I think nailing things like the affinity that people have for the Edinburgh Festival and the Fringe, the tattoo, these things draw people in. And it's about us figuring out how best to work with our partners in Scotland uh, to effectively monetize that. And people in America are not shy about that. Uh, fundraising in America is an industry. Uh, the tax codes are written to promote uh, philanthropic giving. These are things that we should be tapping into. Uh, I do think that there's much more that we can do there uh, and we're working really hard to try and figure out exactly how we do that. And again, with a, a small office of three people, we can't do everything for everyone. So it's a little bit about pointing people in the right direction, holding their hand and letting them get out into the market across the US. So thank you for that. That's a really interesting answer. And you know, it's just my personal view, but I think there is a lot to be, to be done here. And a lot, a lot, you know, it's a really interesting area where the international offices can contribute. Can I move to the question of the location of Scotland's international offices? Um, and I should hasten to add, I'm not asking you to justify the location of where you're working from or, or in any way question where you're working from. But I think this, this has come up in the committee before. And it's really a question of, are we in the right places? You know, we're not in South America. We have a, a very limited um, presence in Africa. Um, there are lots of reasons to be in South America, for instance, uh, trade, uh, lots of reasons to be in, in Africa. Um, and I just wanted your general view, if you can give it, about uh, where we are internationally and where you would like to see us 
B if we're not there already, uh, in, in the context of you know, uh, um, you know, difficult, a difficult financial picture, you know, resources are limited, obviously. But um, welcome your just general observations on that. If I could start perhaps with Katrina. Thank you. Um, so the the China office, um, or the Scottish government office uh, in China opened way back in 2005. Um, so I think we were one of the, the earlier openings, um, although SDI had a presence here uh, earlier than us, uh, going back to 2003. Um, and then, yeah, I believe that the network uh, grew um, in recent years. Um, it's a really good question and um, actually coming from the background that I have, I see value in having offices in a number of places um, overseas. I guess the question is um, uh, about budget and affordability um, and where you know you can you can actually uh, uh, open offices. Um, I understand there is a, a commitment to open an office uh, in Warsaw. Um, uh, within this uh, uh, government. Um, I don't know of any uh, other plans. Um, uh, given my background uh, before I came to China, I was actually in New Delhi. Um, so, you know, India being a, a place of uh, multiple opportunities. But as you say, it, it's, it's very difficult to, to pinpoint, I guess, the question is, yeah, how big is the budget? Um, and then, then work from that. Of course, it would be great to have uh, many more offices uh, overseas. Sorry, that, I realize that's hedging the question no, a bit. It's, it, it, I know it's a, diff <laughs> it's a difficult question. And, and I mean, I think that, that you know, the point that several of you have made is, is you have relatively small offices with two or three people um, in them. And you know, there is a question as to you know, how far that can go given the size of the country that you're, you're based in. Uh, I wonder if Katrine or, or Christopher have, have anything to add. Katrine. Thank you very much, Deputy Convener. So my, my background before I joined External Affairs and, and uh, flitted off to Copenhagen was, was in our International Trade and Investment Directorate for the Scottish Government. And in that context, I was part of developing the evidence base for all three of the international economy plans. And I think that process of really interrogating what it was that we were trying to do and therefore what the evidence was telling us in terms of where we ought to have people located, resources located, was really powerful. And it's something I'm very keen to take with me over into, into the external affairs side of, of Scottish government. I think where we ought to be it is kind of one of those questions that every single government on the planet struggles with. And I think you could justify just about anywhere, but I think the trick is to make a decision about what it is that you want to achieve. Are you going into a location because you want to have international development connections, because it's sort of pure diplomacy, because it's trade and investment? Therefore, what kind of resources do you want to have? One of the really fascinating things about being based in the Nordics is that we're not the only ones that operate on a regional basis here. So Ireland do to an extent, New Zealand do, Iceland do. The Faroes actually run their relationship with every country in which they're not based through Copenhagen. So, so there's lots of kind of models that we can explore about how do we get at some of those opportunities? Um, I guess particularly for me, the, the, the thing that I would like us to bear in mind in doing this is looking at what the gap is. So, so we can go into a market that's already very, very well developed with relatively limited resources and probably not have huge impact, or, or we could be going in and trying to open something from a kind of a closed door perspective, we probably also wouldn't be that impactful in that scenario. So where is the kind of the sweet spot? Um, I, I don't actually have the evidence in front of me at some stage, but I do think it's something that we need to look at really seriously. And Christopher? Yeah, I mean, I would echo what, what both my colleagues have said, and selfishly sitting here in the US, I'd love to have more resource in the US. Uh, as I said, 330 million people, currently three people in my office. Uh, at full staffing, we are a mighty four. Uh, but that doesn't allow us to do as much as, as we'd, we'd like to be able to do. I, you know, Kat's, Kat's given a bit about her back. Well, both cats have given a bit about their background, and my, my background is economic development. So I see the opportunities that we can't get to because we just don't have enough people. I see what my FCDO colleagues who are on platform with me at the embassy are able to do and the outreach that they're able to get across the economy, but across culture and across sort of soft diplomacy as well. So I would be all for having more resources, but the question goes back to how limited are the resources and what else could you be spending that money on? It's a, there's a, a cost benefit analysis to be done. 
SDI do a lot of great work where we're not where we don't have diplomatic missions in countries, but there are definitely things that we can add and augment to what SDI already offer. Thank you for that. Thank you, Kavina. Thank you. Mr. Rusko? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just stay with, with that theme, actually, um, and ask you, uh, perhaps with CATS, just about the, the priorities of the, of the European Union, because uh, something I've, I've sort of picked up with a number of the committee visits we've done recently is that there's a an increasing focus with the European Union on the, the accession states on, on the east. Um, so I wanted just to get your, your thoughts on that in terms of responding to the agenda of, of the EU and integrating and working with the EU, um, where you think that, that sort of you know, frontier of deeper engagement is um, and how, how potentially a, a Warsaw office could could uh, could feed into that. So I maybe, maybe just go to Kat with that one just now. Thank you very much. It's a great set of <clears throat> questions, really. I, and, and I think there some, some of the questions uh, have their answers at home in Scotland. A lot of the work that we're doing on uh, alignment and retention of EU law and, and, and tracking effectively still where the EU is going, even though we are we are outside it. Uh, I think is really important for understanding where it as an organisation or as a series of organisations is, is moving to. If our intention is to stay uh, aligned and friendly to it, then we need to, to first of all be aware of, of where it's going. The second part uh, of that answer in terms of how we engage with some of those potential candidate countries, I think some of the work that we've done around uh, Ukraine and particularly Ukrainian refugees, but also engaging with, with some of our Baltic neighbours around, uh, around what that picture looks like is really important. Again, at all times seeking to understand where are these sets of organisations moving to and therefore where do we need to stand in order to remain relevant to them. I think one of the challenges that we're seeing, and this is this is maybe where some of the Nordic part of the, the answer to this comes in, is that there's no doubt at all that all European Union member states see each other as the primary force. So, so where they focus their resources on international engagement, they will focus it first of all on each other second of all, on larger global blocks, uh, and, and, and only then on others. Uh, so we have to work really, really hard to have something relevant that offers into that wider European connection. I mentioned energy, that isn't just from, from the economic opportunity, it's also from energy security. The offer that Scotland has to make Europe on that is actually really, really critical for its industrial future. And I think framing it in those terms probably gets us into, into more rooms. So that's something that we're, we're starting to explore. Um, and then I think the part of that sort of brand awareness that Scotland is open, Scotland still wants to be a part of this, is actually really important as well. We still get a very, very friendly welcome, and I think it's incredibly important that we maintain that over the next decade, essentially, to make sure that Europe is still aware that Scotland does want to align. There's, there's a lot of global uh, instability, geopolitical instability, essentially wanting to be part of something stable, I think, sends a really strong message. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um can I pick up one, one thread of that then? I mean, looking at the, um, the international network you know, strategy, there, there's quite a, a strong focus on hydrogen that brings in a number of different offices. It's got the house in Brussels, team in China, France, Germany, and I imagine Copenhagen's in that mix as well. Um, I'm, just, I'm interested to know how that work is, is coordinated practically because you know, it, I guess it could look a bit disparate in terms of looking at particular... Uh, economic opportunities in different <coughs> countries, but you know who, who's kind of leading that work? Is that is that cabinet secretary with energy responsibility here? How is that work uh, on hydrogen being aligned with direction of travel of the UK government as well uh, on hydrogen? So I, I think we could just get a kind of a sense of, of that. So I could go back to Kat on that. I, I could bring in uh, Katrina as well because I know the China office has been involved in that, but. I'll maybe stick with Kat just now and then we can bring in others. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, so it, it is an energy policy lead and therefore an, an energy ministry lead, ministerial lead as well. Uh, what I will say is that all of the offices, certainly across Europe, are absolutely engaged in this, I suspect, across the, our, our global network, but with different roles. So, so the office in... Berlin has done absolutely amazing work in uh, driving out German partners for offtake, essentially. So, so where will where will hydrogen be sold to in the future? Who will have a need of using it? The Nordics is a slightly different proposition. Here, we're working with countries that, like Scotland, will have the ability to supply 
uh, that hydrogen. And so what we are looking for is making sure that we are working with those Nordic partners on what the supply chain looks like to build out the renewable energy that's going to generate it, what the regulations around it might look like. We can inadvertently end up influencing EU regulations via the Nordics by having some of those conversations, and I think that's quite important. Uh, you also asked about how we work with the UK government. In this UK... Uh, was was allowed back into the uh, North Sea Energy Cooperation uh, Agreement last year. That was really positive. Uh, Scotland already had some really good ongoing conversations with Denmark and Norway around what energy looked like in this space. And what we've done is, is actually deliberately join forces here. The, the fundamental is the UK needs Scotland to achieve its net zero targets in order for it to achieve its own. And all of us on that European security level actually need this to, to happen as well, as well as on an economic level. So here is an area where it just serves us to work as a, as a block and to make sure that everybody understands where everybody else is going. And that's what we're trying to do. Our offer back to, to energy colleagues and, and to the energy uh, uh, minister and CABSEC is that we basically work on behalf of the energy team here. So there is a really, really close coordination in the background. We've recently added a thematic lead to that uh, so that we have somebody traveling across Europe and essentially helping us to coordinate that work. It's, it's absolutely mission critical. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Can I bring Katrina then, given the, the Chinese uh, Beijing office perspective on it? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, maybe I can give um, a, a sort of specific example um, just to illustrate how we how we work together um, and with our energy team colleagues uh, back uh, back home. Um, so uh, uh, this is around the issue of um, Grangemouth, the f future of Grangemouth. Um, a meeting that Mr. Robertson had uh, when he was here um, in China uh, was with um, PetroChina, so one of the, the partners of the joint venture um, in Grangemouth. Um, what do I want to say about this? So I, wa I wanted to explain that um, on that issue, it's not a lead for us as a Scottish Government office, it's not a lead for the Cabinet Secretary. Um, but because we've got very close links with our energy colleagues back home um, and with the um, uh, Mr. Gray, who covers that, um, uh, you know, has responsibility for that area, it means that we can work quickly on the ground here um, when we need to, to raise issues with, um, uh, in this case, uh, PetroChina. Um, so having those links meant... Uh, that uh, when Mr. Uh, Robertson was out here and there was a, an announcement the same week um, uh, by the joint venture um, uh, company uh, on PetroChina, it meant that we could go in um, uh, on the ground, have face-to-face -face meeting, you know, about the, that particular issue. Um, we got up-to-date uh, briefing from our energy colleagues, um, you know, overnight in a matter of hours. Uh, we were able to feed back, uh, you know, the results of the the meeting that Mr. Robertson had with the with the president of um, PetroChina on the ground here. Um, so those links, uh, actually being out here on the ground and being able to link up with colleagues back home really quickly are really important pressing issues uh, for Scotland. I think makes a big difference. And then the the other dimension uh, you you asked about, you know, working with um, the UK government. So. You know, on that particular issue, um, uh, we invited along to the meeting uh, a UK government official from the, the British Embassy to join us because it was so important to give that, you know, a uh, joined up uh, view on that particular issue. Um, and then just a wee bit more background, if I if I sort of step back, it's uh, uh, working with our colleagues um, back home in the Scottish government and UK government here. Uh, we had a meeting with um, uh, the, the chair of China National Petroleum Corporation, so CMPC, um, uh, in the summer, um, which uh, the embassy invited me along to because one of the issues that was going to be discussed was Grangemouth. So uh, all of that joined upness um, really helps uh, us uh, uh, on the ground um, and hopefully... Um, yeah, a joined up approach uh, that yeah. will uh, have longer term benefits. Thanks for those examples. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Chowdhury. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, I think my question is in line with uh, my colleagues, uh, Donald Cameron and Mark has already asked. Uh, how do we measure the impact of international offices on trade in 
comparison with places where we do not have international offices, such as Bangladesh or Brazil, uh, in terms of measurable uh, outcomes. I'm looking at Katrina. Katrina. <laughs> 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 Me? Um, that's a really good question, and I, um, I think uh, even though we, we sit out in our, you know, our offices, me in Beijing, Katrina in Copenhagen, Chris in, in Washington, um, we don't always have those, uh, you know, stats and data to hand. Um, so, you know, we rely on uh, reports from others in terms of, um, you know, what the, the latest information is on, on exports. Um, so, for example, on China, um, uh, two weeks ago, we were saying um, uh, that China was the, uh, if I get this right, I think it was, we we're saying China was Scotland's 13th largest export. But actually, uh, just in the last uh, week or at the end of November, we had updated uh, statistics that said China is Scotland's sixth largest export market, um, excluding oil and gas. So that sort of stuff, you know, we, we don't sit and sort of, um, uh, sort of generate from our offices, but rely on, you know, reports, uh, external reports to give us that information. So I guess that's, that's the same for, you know, places where we don't have um, offices or, or representation. It's, it's a reliance on those, you know, external reports and, and data uh, and analysis. But then, of course, you have, some, have to have somebody there working and actually analysing them uh, and deciding what, what to do next with, with that information. Katrina or, or Christopher, did you want to? Yeah, Christopher, those? yeah. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Choudhury. I think it's a really interesting question because it goes to the heart of why we are in, uh, in market as diplomats. Uh, there are SDI teams around the world where we don't have diplomatic representation. I think, I, again, the statistics are not something that I have to hand, but if you asked my SDI colleagues, uh, in the US, would, are they happier with us in country supporting them or happier without us being there? I would very, very much hope that they would say they're much happier with us here and that we give them a boost to the trade and investment work that they do. Uh, as for, for other offices and whether that would be helpful in, in uh, markets uh, like the, the subcontinent or, or other places in the world, I would very much hope that would be the case. Uh, but it's a little bit of speculation that uh, whether that would be a, a good thing or not. I uh, very much hope that uh, having any further offices would augment and add to uh, what our colleagues in SDI are already doing, and most of which is, is fantastic, fantastic work. Katrina, I think we're left with one. Katrina. <laughs> <laughs> Katrina, sorry. Yeah, so, I'm, I mean, it's almost... It's almost impossible, isn't it, to, to measure what you what you don't know uh, or what isn't happening. Um, I think, as Chris says, it would be really nice if we could see us moving into, like we've just moved into the Nordic, so there are already really strong export markets and already real, really strong inward investors in, into Scotland. It'd be nice to think that over the first period of the office being open, we would see an uptick in that. Um, but again, with three people covering all of these countries, that, that might be a slightly unrealistic kind of causal um, relationship to, to draw from it. I, I do think we're, uh, where we're really maturing as a network, and, and that isn't just in the Nordics, is, is, as Chris says, that ability to mix diplomacy and trade. So quite often the two open doors for each other. We had a really good experience working with, with SDI and also with UK government around uh, Wind Europe over the past year, uh, where the fact that we were able to field senior officials as well as trade specialists to speak to major investors like Vestas, like Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, like Maersk, that makes a difference. You have a you have a different quality of conversation with them. And we have subsequently seen an uptick in the in the follow up conversations from those companies in what's happening in, in Scotland. So while I would never I think put us in a position where I would say three people are responsible for delivering a massive uptick in, in trade and investment. I would say, again, you can measure some of this qualitatively and hopefully over time we'll be able to see it quantitatively as well. May I ask, uh, the, do you believe uh, there is a need for the location of Scottish uh, government international office to be uh, reviewed? I think it's something we should always have uh, under review, to be honest. We, we, and we always have done. Um, 
as I said, I came into this from international trade and investment. We went through a process of of working with SDI to check whether they were in the right locations. I think we always need to be alive to the kinds of companies we're trying to help export, the kinds of international investors that we're, we're trying to land into the economy and make sure that we're in the right places for that. Um, for my personal opinion at the moment, I think those markets where we can blend the diplomatic and the trade are probably the ones where we will get the most value. But that's not to say that you can't run ahead a little bit with, with particularly with some of the trade functions. And it's also not to say that we can't and shouldn't, we absolutely should be leaning on the much, much bigger UK G resources. So, so DBT have can't, I've lost, I've lost count, but I think it's like 200 and odd people <laughs> in, in Beijing and, and sort of resources that we can only dream about. The more aware we can make them of exciting and interesting things that are happening in, in the Scottish economy, the more they're willing to use it and the more we can have benefit even when we're not there. Alexander? I mean, it's been a very interesting discussion this morning and I thank you for your participation. You know, you... you are all the window of Scotland and wherever you're located. And, and that is fantastic to see. And there obviously are successes that are happening on a continual basis. But you have to manage uh, trade and industry, culture, education, innovation, energy. You know, the list is endless. Uh, uh, and you're trying to do that uh, with the capacity issues that you've identified this morning. Uh, so what becomes the priority for you? Uh, in, in ensuring that, that you capture the market you want to, because, yes, we'd like to have you doing all of that, but that's not possible with the people and the resources that you have. Uh, so how do you square that circle to ensure that you, you, you are, are trying to capture as much of these areas as you can, but what priority do you think is specific to the location that you are in uh, that, that is uh, you, you, your biggest market or the one you want to develop the most or the one that has the most potential uh, because as I say you, you cannot cover it all uh, but I think you're trying to do that uh, and you have cooperation uh, from UK and embassies and others uh, who you can pull on uh, but, but what is uh, your main priority for each of you within your own location and if I can start with Katrina first. Yes, thank you. Um, so you're right, uh, we, we can't do everything. Um, and when I talk about the, the three pillars of work that we focus on, um, uh, you know, we have to uh, drill down under each of those um, and decide what is our priority for, you know, the coming 12 months and, and sometimes longer over, you know, the next few years in order to, to try and, you know, achieve our objectives. Um, I think one important thing is uh, right at the start of the business planning uh, exercise. Um, so uh, my colleagues have, you know, referred to how we work with others, including SDI. Uh, we now, each of our offices, um, have a joint business plan with SDI. So I think that helps us uh, drill down under the pillar of trade and investment, uh, to which are the things that would be most useful for us to focus on over the 12 months. Um, I think for the, the other areas uh, for me um, and thinking about the just the huge the size of China and the opportunity and the different you know local governments, um, this year we did a bit of work about um, which local governments we wanted to um, sort of focus um, uh, attention on, if you like, and, and resource on. Um, we'd love to engage with every single, you know, province and local government in China, uh, but we have to, to work through them. Uh, one example is um, uh, Kunming, for example. Uh, so we, we did a lot of work with Kunming uh, in the lead up to COP15. Um, so uh, this year uh, we focused on trying to, to build uh, through that link. Um, and that was one of the reasons for uh, Mr. Robertson visiting Kunming as well as uh, Beijing and Shanghai when he was out. So, so there are various ways to cut it, um, but I think the, that initial business uh, planning uh, process is key and also bringing in stakeholders at that point to make sure that we're delivering not what we think we ought to be delivering, but actually what brings real value back to um, colleagues in, in headquarters and you know can really um, help uh, deliver um, uh, the objectives and goals uh, set uh, at the centre. 
Um, and but you're right, working with with partners is is absolutely essential. Uh, we couldn't um, achieve uh, what we want to achieve and the benefits for Scotland by by working alone. Um, so those links are are, are vital to us uh, in being able to deliver. Thank, Thank you. you, Katrine. What do you think is your main priority in in Copenhagen, or what do you see as the main priority? Yeah, I mean, it, it's almost like um, a layer of sieves, isn't it? How do we use our mandate as an international office to contribute towards Scottish Government's missions in a way that has traction in the countries that we're working in uh, and in a way that also has a, a kind of a client or somebody that is, is interested in working with us back in, in Scotland. So we have, as, as Kat has described, we, we have essentially three long-term goals uh, and those are around energy in the North Sea. They're around... Uh, learning from the Nordic consensus model of democracy and the things that we can bring back to to running uh, good public services in Scotland. And, and they're around really using Scotland's brand to promote uh, culture and particularly cultural exports. Within any given year and within any given country, we then are, are kind of chopping and changing to to what we think has has most traction, essentially. So with Norway at the moment, it's very definitely uh, CCUS. So that's where the focus is. Uh, with Denmark on energy, it, it's much broader. And, and so keeping those conversations uh, going in parallel essentially is, is, is actually part of, part of where we put the effort. Um, because we only have those three, what we also have is a, is a kind of an opportunist rule that we only do our business planning for 75% of our resources. And that gives us a little bit of flexibility when something else pops up that just looks absolutely amazing uh, that, that we can therefore go chasing. I, I um, I think it's actually worth highlighting some of the uh, some of the people and some of the behaviours that you have sitting in, in the offices overseas. Uh, there's a whole bunch of us basically that are are wildly curious and wildly opportunistic, um, but at the same time actually have a, a good measure of kind of governance and structure around it because otherwise the, you're right the thing does fall apart. And Christopher, I mean America has you know so much to offer. You've already said that, uh, uh, and on so many levels. Yeah, and thank you for the question, Mr. Stewart. And I think part of your question contained part of the answer. It is horses for courses for different offices. Our, uh, my colleagues sitting in European offices will have much greater focuses on uh, clean energy and things like that. We're never going to export energy to the US. Energy security is national security for the US. So when we talk about energy, we talk about investment into Scotland rather than selling to other countries. And being located in the country, as, as Kat touched on, allows you to have your finger on the pulse. It allows you to be entrepreneurial and say, actually, what's going on just now is slightly different from what we planned a year ago. So you can you can shift. And those business plans that both my colleagues referred to are not just done jointly with the SDI. When, when our business plans are created, we're going out to departments across the Scottish government. We're going to our agencies and saying, what are your priorities? How can we help you by being in country? How can we help deliver for uh, Scottish enterprise? How can we help deliver for Creative Scotland and Screen Scotland when we're in country? And I mentioned that we've got uh, our six uh, sort of big pillars that we have in country or as part of our business plan, all of them feed for me into trade investment and into money and jobs going back into Scotland. That's how I that's how I justify my existence. That's what I get up in the morning for. And trying to do everything as you alluded to is why I sound like this today, because we are running about with small resources, doing as much as we possibly can. Uh, but that, that business planning, I think, is absolutely key to it. It's done with partners in Scotland. It's done with partners in country. And it's also coordinated centrally through, through DEXA and through colleagues. So we're not just going about picking the things that we think are going to be good in country. It all contributes to, to a larger whole under the three priorities that we get from ministers in our, our priority mandate. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. And a final question from Mr Brown. Yes, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Ms Forbes said earlier on that she didn't want to get to comment uh, on political events, but you do work in a political environment. And um, from the time that I was in government uh, relating to external affairs, uh, SDI and so on, things have changed. This is probably the worst I can remember. And I would cite the letters from Alistair Jack and from David Cameron, which are a cross between a juvenile huff and and uh, some control freakery, which really do set the context for the environment in which you need to work. Now, my memory is that despite that, the civil servants, both in the Scottish Government and the UK Government, did manage to work pretty effectively together. Um, and I'd just be interested to hear whether that is still the case, um, is whether it's a constructive relationship, and also whether there's a difference uh, in areas where 
The Scottish office is located within a UK embassy um, and those where it's not. There may not be, I'm just interested if that seems to make a difference. But, so it's really just for a comment on how the civil service uh, work together between the different administrations. And if I can start with uh, Christopher. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Mr Brown. And uh, uh, it's a chance for me to boast because uh, the recent uh, Scottish Affairs Committee report uh, in the House of Commons actually highlighted the work done in the US as an example of partnership between the Scottish and the UK government. I'm really pleased to be able to say that uh, the relationships we have at post here in, in the US are fantastic. Uh, I got on really well with the, the ambassador, with the deputy ambassador and with uh, colleagues from the UK government. Uh, things can happen at home and in the political sphere, which will have an impact on what we do. As, as officials, our job is to get, get the work done. Uh, we have our priorities, we have what we do, we don't get involved in politics. Uh, and we, we are in regular communication with our, our colleagues. I'm based in the, in the British Embassy in uh, DC. I have a slot at our all staff meeting for all the US on a Monday morning. I talk about what our priorities are and what we do. And as a result of that, I'm able to then broadcast Scot messages about what Scotland is interested in, what we're good at and what we're looking to do across the entire UK network in the US. And I frequently get feedback from colleagues in the UK government saying, actually, what you said was really interesting. How can we work together? Uh, so for me, I, it's, it's really positive. Uh, the politics we watch and try and stay as far away from as possible. Uh, but we work really well together with those colleagues. So it's, it's not something that you'll, you'll find me complaining about. I don't have to wear a hard hat to work. Uh, and we, we don't have any fights about it in the office. It's, it's genuinely very positive. Yeah, thanks. I acknowledge the work you do, but just say if you can try and mirror the success we had in Canada by getting haggis reinstated as an import to the US, that would be good as well. Uh, Katrine, any comments? Yeah, I, I suppose just to echo Chris, I, I think we need to be a little bit cautious about uh, taking what, what is played out in the media quite often uh, as, as the reality on, on the ground. Uh, the reality of the relationships we have with the, the British embassies across the Nordics and Baltics is it's actually really good. We uh, we landed really well. We've established ourselves really well. We are seen as part of the embassy team. Um, we've also worked really hard to establish a series of, of joint events and joint working groups so that we are all aware of each other's priorities and, and, and sort of able to make ourselves relevant to each other. Of course, we're all aware of the context that we operate in. And of course, we have conversations about how, how best to manage that, essentially. Uh, but as Chris says, our job is to manage that. And, and so far, it's going very well. Thank you. And Katrina? Yes, thank you. I, I would echo um, what Chris and Katrine uh, have said. Um, it's the same here um, in Beijing and across the China network. So. Uh, with the British Embassy and also their Consulates General. Uh, we have a really good relationship, really good working relationship. It's very collaborative and um, we coordinate on some um, uh, events and activities together. Um, like Chris, I join um, the regular Monday morning meeting, um, which helps uh, me stay connected. Um, I'm part of the China Board of Management. Um, uh, I have regular meetings and catch up, catch, catch ups, catch ups. Yeah, meetings uh, with the deputy head of mission. Um, when I first arrived uh, last summer, um, one of the first things that I, I remember doing was um, actually a joint vlog uh, with the ambassador um, uh, at the Highland Games uh, in Beijing uh, to promote Scotland. So. And we do have a very good uh, working uh, relationship on the ground, um, which I think is is so important um, uh, operating uh, out here. Um, uh, and I, re I really appreciate that that close collaboration that we have. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think that comes to the end of our, our time. Um, thank you all so much for what has been a very informative um, uh, and useful discussion with the committee, um, uh, particularly for those who have uh, had an early start. I think, Christopher, you mentioned your enthusiasm for your job. You used the phrase, it was what gets you up in the morning. Well, you've certainly demonstrated that today. <laughs> um, and uh, as it is our last uh, meeting, I um, wish everyone the very best for the festive season and in the context of our international visitors and our discussion earlier on uh, Peace on Earth. So thank you. I'll close the meeting now. <laughs>